It's my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Dr. Hiba Shindi. Dr. Hiba, she is a consultant allergist and immunologist at Tawam Hospital. She joined the hospital in, at the end of 2015, I guess, right? And she's here already for five years. Probably is more important than reading whatever is mentioned in the booklets here. Uh, I just want to let you know that Dr. Hiba, when she joined, she really complement the, the immunology or the clinical immunology service in UAE. I will not say at uh, the Wam hospital. And uh, she take the lead. Uh, fortunately, uh, we are able to work together for a short period of time. And then uh, a couple of residents, they have some interest in starting also clinical immunology service. Uh, the good news, the first publication about the Immune deficiency spectrum in UAE was published recently, on 31st of uh, January 2022. So congratulations, Hiba. I think she will be the best probably to, to, to show you what's the importance of immune deficiency. Here talk is the ABC of primary immune deficiency. I think you are uh, not going to talk about hereditary regime anymore, right? Because I think Hamid's talk will cover that very well. So the is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Hamadi, for the um, kind introduction, and Professor Buzahkouk and the scientific committee for asking me to speak today about a topic that's very, very close to my heart, primary immune deficiency. And we are happy that we have published uh, the data on our patients, but unfortunately, I'm only talking about the ABCs of diagnosis. I will not be presenting that today. So um, the overview of my talk today, I will speak about what primary immune deficiencies are, the new names actually inborn errors of immunity, when to suspect and how to investigate. I will speak a little more detail about severe combined immune deficiency, which, which we regard as uh, an emergency, about antibody deficiencies, which are uh, the most common form of primary immune deficiencies. I will touch on PID treatment options because there will be a talk on transplant and gene therapy after me, uh, but I'm not talking about HAE today. That's been done by my colleague, Dr. Hamid. So the first case of primary immune deficiency was published in 1952 by Dr. Bruton when he described an eight-year-old boy with recurrent pneumococcal sepsis. Um, when he did protein electrophoresis for this boy, he found that he missed the gamma chain which is equivalent to IgG. So he started him with replacement therapy, giving it subcutaneously of immunoglobulins. So the first report on primary immune deficiency was also the first report on immunoglobulin replacement therapy. So from then we moved a very long way and now we have at least 452 distinct primary immune deficiency groups reported by the end of 2020. And the name has been changed from primary immune deficiency to inborn areas of immunity because we're recognizing more and more that it's not only infection, that these heterogeneous group of immune function and regulation um, also uh, present as autoimmune disease, as granulomas, as atopy, lymphoproliferation, and malignancy, highlighting the importance of the immune system, not only in fighting infections, but in recognizing self, in controlling inflammation, and in fighting tumors. Um, they were previously thought to be rare, but they're no longer rare, um, ranging with a prevalence range between one in 10,000 to one in 50,000. And we have a higher rate in areas where there is a more consanguinity like the UAE. And this increase in prevalence is attributed to uh, better definitions, better understanding and awareness, and availability of better tests, especially molecular testing. They range from very mild conditions like selective IgA deficiency, where most patients are asymptomatic, to severe and potentially fatal conditions like severe combined immune deficiency. So the most recent report in 2019 from the International Union of Immunological Societies um, classifies inborn errors of immunity into 10 groups. The first group is immunodeficiency affecting cellular and humoral immunity, or what we called combined immunodeficiency because it affects both the T and B cell compartments. The second group is combined immunodeficiency with associated syndromes. Examples are like George syndrome or Scott Aldrich syndrome. The third group is um, antibody deficiencies. And the fourth group, which is an entity of its own, are defects of immune dysregulation. 
An example is IPICS, which is um, the abbreviation of um, immune deficiency, polyendocrinopathy, um, entropathy, and x linked And these boys present quite early in life with um, severe autoimmune entropathy, severe diarrhea with failure to strive, um, severe eczema, diabetes mellitus, um, hypothyroidism, and it's a defect in a, a group of cells called T regulatory cells that are important in regulating the immune function. And the treatment for them is bone marrow transplantation. Another example is ALPS, uh, which is autoimmune for proliferative um, syndrome, where there's a defect in apoptosis, which leads to benign lymphoproliferation, presenting as lymphadenopathy or huge splenomegaly and autoimmune cytopenias. Then we have um, congenital phagocytic defects of numbers, like the congenital neutropenias, or a function like chronic granulomatous disease or leukocyte adhesion deficiency. The defects in intrinsic and innate immunity, generally that specific defect will predispose to one infection or a group of infections. So for example, you have the interferon gamma L12 pathway defect, where these patients would only be susceptible to mycobacterial disease or CARD9 and Dectin1, where they will only be susceptible to fungal disease, or toll like receptor 3, where they get herpes simplex encephalitis, but no other infections. Um, the autoinflammatory diseases, um, in these patients, there is a defect in the function of the inflammasome, which is important in controlling inflammation. And these patients present, they can't switch off inflammation, and they present with recurrent episodes of fever associated with high inflammatory markers, uh, the most common known to us is a familial Mediterranean fever. Then we have the complement deficiencies, where it's the effect of one of the complement proteins. Recently, they've added the bone marrow failure syndromes to um, inborn areas of immunity and phenocopies of primary immune deficiency, where the defect is not genetic. The effect is either somatic defect or there are autoantibodies to uh, a molecule of the immune system. And in some cases, we never get to the, a, a clear genetic diagnosis, uh, despite even doing genetic testing, but they will have the phenotype and the lab test to fit, fit into one of these groups. And these would be called unclassified PID and would be uh, put in that specific group. So when do we suspect primary immune deficiency? This is a publication from 2011 from Model, and they suggest that anybody who has four or more ear infections a year, two or more sinus infections, two or more pneumonias a year, two or more months of antibiotics without response, failure of an infant to thrive, if they get recurrent deep-seated or organ abscesses, if they have persistent oral thrush or skin fungal infection, if they need IV antibiotics to clear infections, or if they have two or more seated, deep seated infections like meningitis or septicemia, or there's a positive history of primary immune deficiency, you should think about um, primary immune deficiency. Um, of these, the most sensitive one, uh, one warning sign was found to be family history. And really, other than infections, what I would encourage you to look at is also unusual physical characteristics, for example, of syndromes that are known to be associated with primary immune deficiency, like um, ataxia telangiectasia. Do they have telangiectasia? Do they have ataxia or Dijor syndrome? If you get an unusual um, organism, so if you get pneumocystis gerodesi, you, you must be immune deficient. You just don't get pneumocystis if you're immunocompetent. If you have chronic EBV viremia or disseminated CMV, there must be an immune, immune deficiency. If you have complications of infection, like bronchiectasis or a chronic sinusitis, if there's a lymphoid malignancy, especially if it's EBV driven, that should warrant you to think about primary immune deficiency, or if you have multiple autoimmune disease. So when we're thinking about the clinical presentation of different groups, antibody deficiencies typically present with bacterial infection, usually encapsulated bacteria like Haemophilus or Streptococcus, with recurrent sinopulmonary otitis media pneumonias and GI infection. And we see it um, in young patients um, after rota, for example, vaccination, uh, because it's an enterovirus. They're specifically prone to enteroviruses. Um, complement defects, um, C2 to C4 defects, 
um, uh, patients are prone to encapsulated organisms as well, whereas C5 to C9 defects are particularly susceptible to Neisseria, and they can present with recurrent Neisserial meningitis or sepsis. The complement system is very important in clearing immune complexes, and that's why we find that uh, patients with defects in early classical complement pathways will get a lupus kind of phenotype, whereas if there are defects in the um, um, inhibitors or regulators of complement, patients may get atypical hemolyticuremic syndrome. Um, patients with T cell immune defects or combined immune defects get opportunistic infections, prolonged viral infections, bacterial, fungal infections, and they're also prone to autoimmune disease and malignancies. Um, patients with defects in phagocytes are prone to bacterial infections, specifically staphylococcal pseudomonas, as well as mycobacterial infections. They get fungal infections, and patients with leukocyte adhesion deficiency have the cardinal feature of delayed separation of the cord for usually more than 40 days. Um, herpes family viruses are more or less a sole infection in patients with NK cell defects. So where can patients with primary immune deficiency present? Literally everywhere, pulmonologists, we get a lot of referrals from um, pulmonologists where they present with bronchiectasis or recurrent pneumonias, they can have granulomas, they can have interstitial lung disease, which will ID with all of the infections above to the gastroenterologist. One thing we would want people to think about if they have features of autoimmune enteropathy, or IBD, especially if early onset, early onset IBD in children should raise the suspicion of a primary immune deficiency. Present to ENT with recurrent otitis media or sinus infections and to hematology oncology with multiple autoimmune cytopenias and lymphoproliferation, especially if EBV driven or to general pediatricians or physicians. So how do we investigate them? From the history um, and examination, we can get a rough idea as to what part of the immune system is affected. We can measure um, um, that quantitatively. If there are any subclasses or subsets, we will check them, look for any functional um, tests in vivo or in vitro, and then can we confirm this by a molecular test? So for example, we will start with the phagocyte deficiencies. I highly encourage everybody thinking about the primary immune deficiencies to look at the CBC. Look at your neutrophil count, is it low? and look at past results, has it always been low? Then that raises the concern of, of um, congenital neutropenia. Is it high and is it part of a leukocytosis? And is that persistent as well? Because that raises suspicion of leukocyte adhesion deficiency. If we're suspecting CGD, there are one of two tests we can do, the dihydrorhodamine test or nitrobrew tetrazoleum test. Uh, for leukocyte adhesion deficiency, we can look at the expression of um, receptors on flow cytometry. For the screening for complement defects, we have two tests, the CH50, which measures the function of the um, classical and terminal pathways, and the AH50, which measures um, the function of the alternate and terminal pathways. And depending on what results we get, we can check for specific complement components. Um, for antibody deficiencies, you need to check all immunoglobulins, IgG, A, and M, and don't forget IgE. It can give you a very good clue, like hyper-IgE, Job syndrome, or doc 8 syndrome can have a very high IgE. Um, look at the IgG subclasses. And for a functional test, we look at vaccine responses to polysaccharide antigens and see how patients respond to those. If we're thinking about the combined immune deficiency, Again, on a CBC, I always encourage people to look at lymphocytes. And if they're low, is this persistently low? Because this could be your only hint to a combined immune deficiency. Then we do lymphocyte subset analysis, looking at your T cells, helper T cells, which are CD4, cytotoxic uh, T cells, which are CD8, CD19s, which are your B cells that can be low in either an antibody or a combined immune deficiency, and your natural killer cells. To measure the lymphocyte function, we can look at proliferation to mitogen or antigen. We can look at CD45, Ra, and Rho, that CD45 are the naive T cells, and, um, and look at TREX, which are T cell receptor ex excision circles. And these are the tests of thymic output, and the measurement of TREX is actually the basis of severe combined immunodeficiency screening. 
um, depending on what we find and what immune deficiency we're considering, in some cases, we can look at the expression of that specific protein. For example, in that Bruton boy, we can test for the Bruton tyrosine kinase protein on flow cytometer. And then we can do molecular analysis by specific panels, for example, IBD panel or antibody deficiency panel. Um, whole exome sequencing is becoming widely available and there are facilities in some labs for whole genome sequencing for diagnosis. So I'll touch a little bit on severe combined immunodeficiency because as I said, um, especially pediatricians need to be aware of it. And it's an inherited PID um, due to T cell immune deficiency. Uh, patients can have normal B and NK cells, but usually B cells, even if they're present, they don't function because you need T cells for normal B cell function. The prevalence is around one in 50,000. It's regarded as a pediatric emergency because these patients will die before the age of one if they do not get a bone marrow transplant. These are the typical skids. The atypical skids can have a milder phenotype and can survive for a bit longer. And Omen syndrome is where they have um, a hypomorphic skid mutation. Uh, they get very, they're born with severe exfoliative skin. They have hepatosplenomegaly. You would find that they have T cells, actually lymphocytosis, but they have a limited repertoire. They can't recognize different antigens. So patients with skid usually present around five or six months of age, sometimes earlier with persistent viral infections, uh, paraflu, it can be RHV, just a simple infection that persists. With CMV, um, they can present with ARDS, uh, secondary tenomocystis. Um, they can be very sick with um, diarrhea, chronic diarrhea and failing to thrive. They can have oral thrush or other fungal infections. And for us, BCG is a specific problem uh, because we give it uh, at birth, and a good number of our patients presented with disseminated BCGosis. And some of them may have a family history of early infant death or of a known primary immune deficiency. On a CBC, you may find lymphopenia, but if the T cells are low and the B cells are normal, they may compensate and there may be no lymphopenia. The total lymphocyte count may be normal. Um, usually immunoglobulins are low, but sometimes there is maternal IgG that gives you a normal IgG level. The IgE may be raised in cases of Omen syndrome. On a chest X-ray, look for a thymic shadow. If it's absent, that raises the suspicion of skit. And then the most important test here is the lymphocyte subset analysis. And most of these cases have no T cells or one of the subsets, either CD4 would be missing in the case of MHC class two deficiency or CD8 in the case of um, ZAP80. They will have defective um, lymphocyte function and very low TREX. You may find, you don't really need um, genetic testing for diagnosis, but you may need it for genetic counseling in the future. And whenever we think primary deficiency, in the back of your mind also think, do I need to exclude HIV here? Um, treatment, you need to isolate these patients. If a mother is CMV positive, she should not breastfeed. Any blood products should be irradiated. Um, you need to look hard for infections and treat them promptly. You start them on PCP prophylaxis, antifungal prophylaxis, and antiviral prophylaxis that had previous herpes. But the key thing is that you need tra to transplant them as early as possible to look for a donor and try to transplant them as early as possible. Um, so I'll touch a bit on the common primary antibody deficiencies because these are the most common um, inborn areas of immunity that are frequently seen. We spoke about X-linked agama globulinemia, the Bruton boy. So these boys present usually the first year, second year of life with recurrent sinopulmonary infections, chronic diarrhea. Um, on testing, you will find absent immunoglobulins and very low B cells. And the treatment is immunoglobulin replacement therapy for life. The hyper IgM, we all know that in response to an infection, the first antibody to come up is IgM. And then depending on your organism, this will class switch to either IgG or your antigen, IgG, IgA, or IgE. These patients have a defect in class switching. So typically they will have a high IgM level, low IgA and IgG, and they will, the non-CD40 ligands will have the same presentation XLA and the same treatment. CD40 ligand deficiency is different. It's a, it's a kind of a combined immune deficiency. Transient hypogamma globulinemia of infancy is actually quite common. What happens is that um, 
Um, IgG usually crosses the placenta and you will find the infants at birth have normal or, or high IgG. And with time they start losing their maternal IgG. So some infants have delay in forming their own, usually around between six to nine months of age. And this delay can be prolonged up to four years. Most patients or most cases don't have infections, but some do. And in these cases, you may want to replace them with immunoglobulins or prophylactic antibiotics. Um, common variable immune deficiency is the most common primary immune deficiency in adults after IgA. It's, uh, most cases are sporadic or there are, although there are about a quarter are familial. Now we have established at least 20 genes associated with CVID. And people are not really very aware of it. That's why there is significant delay um, in CVID. So how, we do, how, what, how do we diagnose CVID? Patient will present with one of the following, either recurrent sinopulmonary infections or any kind, you know, usually sinopulmonary or gut infections. They may have autoimmune manifestations like autoimmune cytopenias, granulomas, lymphoproliferation, or a family member with an immune deficiency or CVID. You will find that they have low IgG um, plus IgA or IgM or both. They will have um, poor response to vaccines or low memory, low switch memory B cells. You need to exclude secondary causes of antibody deficiency to make sure there's nothing else causing this. And you diagnose it after the age of four because it might be a transient hypogammaglobulinemia. And you need to ensure that there's no evidence of T cell immune deficiency because if there is, then you're dealing with a combined immune deficiency. So what secondary antibody deficiencies would you think about? Drugs, are these patients on any drugs that cause low immunoglobulins um, like um, anti-epileptics or anti-rheumatic drugs or immunosuppressants like rituximab or cyclophosphamide or long courses of steroids? they have leukemia or lymphoma, which can cause secondary antibody deficiency? Or are they losing IgG through their gut or through their kidneys? Or do they have a congenital lymphangiectasia? So when we, a primary immune deficiency, once we diagnose it, what are the treatment options? Obviously, it will depend on the specific diagnosis. Um, in milder cases, you may consider um, just prophylactic antibiotics. Immunoglobin replacement therapy is available as IV, subcutaneous, or facilitated subcutaneous. And this is a treatment of choice for antibody deficiency and combined immunodeficiencies. Um, you can replace some cytokines. For example, interferon gamma is, uh, can be used in cases of CGD or GCSF, temporarily for neutropenias, or IL-12 or interferon gamma in specific types of type 1 cytokine defects. Enzyme replacement is used widely in hereditary angioedema. We replace C1 inhibitor. And ADA PEG is used in cases of ADA skid until they get into a transplant. Bone marrow transplantation is a treatment of choice for um, combined immunodeficiencies, for some forms of phagocytic defects, and for some forms of immune dysregulation. Thymic transplantation is an option for complete DeGeorge syndrome if they don't have an appropriate BMT donor. And gene therapy has moved a very, very long way in the treatment of some immune deficiencies like um, X-linked and ADA, skid, um, CGD, and with Scott Aldrich syndrome. So as non-immunologists, um, what can we do? Um, consider PID or inborn areas of immunity in any patient who presents with serious, recurrent, unusual, or persistent infection. If they have autoimmune disease, especially multiple autoimmune disease or lymphoproliferative disease. Look at your CBC, look at your lymphocytes and neutrophils on the CBC. If in anybody with recurrent sinopulmonary infections, bronchitis or chronic diarrhea, check immunoglobulins and check lymphocyte subsets if you're suspecting a skid or a combined immunodeficiency or even an antibody deficiency. And you have immunologists here who are available for consultation. Thank you very much.